You will have all heard, I'm sure, that inequality is on the rise and that it's something we should be worried about. Uh, in the next 15 minutes, uh, I want to try to convince you that it isn't true. Uh, and I'm going to do that mainly by looking at the way uh, inequality is measured and some problems with those measures. And then I'm going to suggest at the end of this talk uh, uh, a different way of thinking about inequality, um, a, of measuring it in a sense, and which will reveal that inequality has actually reduced very dramatically over the last 40 years or so. In fact, during precisely the period in which people complain that it's got greater. Um, now, to begin with, let's talk, about, um, let's talk about two kinds of inequality. There's inequality of wealth. Wealth is all the stuff that you have, the assets that you own, less the liabilities. Um, uh, then there's, there's income, what you earn each year let's say. Now I'm going to get to income next. First, let's talk about wealth. Every year, Oxfam comes out at, at the time of the Davos conference, where all the rich people get together, and it gives a statistic, which is a shocking statistic. It tells us how many of the richest people in the world it takes to have the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. So you take the bottom half of the world's population, add up all their wealth, that gives you a number then you find, then you go to the richest person and you keep going down the list until the aggregate wealth of those people is equal to the bottom half. And in 2017, that number of billionaires was eight. Eight, and they were all men. Eight men uh, had as much wealth between them as the entire bottom half of the world's population. Now, this is a silly statistic. Um, for a, for, I'm going to go through a few reasons, but the main one is just that the bottom half of the world's population doesn't have any wealth. That's why you get this very small number at the top. Uh, think of, I mean, for one reason, a lot of the people in the bottom half of the world's population are children, and children generally don't have any wealth. Then you know that a lot of people, they, they don't own really any assets of, uh, of any particular value. Many people in, in very poor countries, they, don't, they simply don't have any wealth. So it's not surprising that a handful of billionaires will, will give you this result. But I want to talk a bit, this gives me an opportunity to talk about what wealth is in ways, and, Ox, and you can learn a bit about wealth by seeing how Oxfam mismeasures it. Some of the poorest people in the world, according to Oxfam, are people who recently graduated from Harvard Law School. Now, the reason for that is that they have debts of, let's say, a quarter of a million US dollars that they paid to get the, the degree, but Oxfam doesn't measure, doesn't count their degree as an asset. Although, of course, it is an asset because it's going to produce earnings for them over the years. That's why they were willing to pay 250000 to get it. So the Oxfam statistics are very skewed because they have all these people who've got debts and haven't yet realized the gains from the investment on the, that they use the debt for, but they count them as being very poor. Another example of this, and it's related, is that they don't count... Uh, they don't count what's known as an annuity when the annuity isn't uh, coming from your private money. Now, some of you will need to know what an annuity is. It's a stream of income that you get. So when you get jobs, hopefully, you'll all be putting money into a pension fund, and then when you retire, you take the lump sum that's accumulated in that pension fund, and you take it out and you buy an annuity. And that annuity guarantees you an income for the rest of your life, um, until, until you die. So it's an insurance product because the insurer's got to work out how likely you are to die and when. Now, in Singapore, let's say, everybody saves privately and they retire with quite a lot on average in their pension pot. I think it's, by now it's about a million and a half on average. And that gives them the annuity. In Finland, nobody saves their retirement because they know that the government is going to give them an annuity. The Finn and the Singaporean are really in the same position They've got a stream of income. They can use it to consume things. But on the Oxfam measure, the Finn is worthless. The Singaporean is worth 1.5 million, or whatever, that, whatever they'd saved. So it, it's, they don't count a lot of wealth that's out there. And the easiest way to see this is to think about the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are very, very wealthy in the sense that they can consume anything they want. Unlimited consumption. That's what you want, right? That's what wealth is for, ultimately. And it doesn't always have to be achieved through private, through private wealth. Now, I want to stop with that because we've got more important things to go on to, but there's an implicit argument in what Oxfam says, the statistic every year, and I just want to clear it up. 
it is, it's this idea that if we just took all the money of the very wealthy people and gave it to the very poor, uh, we'd, we'd make the very poor a, a lot better off. Well, <clears throat> it's interesting just to look, work out what that number is. If we took all the money off those eight richest people in 2017 and gave it, distributed it evenly amongst the world's poorest half, of, how much would each of those people get? Eight dollars. No, it's more than that, actually. Uh, the answer is this. $118. It's a one-off payment, remember. It's not an annual payment. It's just once. They get $118. So I, they could do something nice with that, I suppose, but that's it. And you can imagine the effects that this would have on wealth creation over the long run. Right, now let's get on to income. Uh, most measures of income and in, of inequality are income inequality. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's a bit boring, but there are some technicalities in how you measure income when you're doing these comparisons. So is it before or after tax income that you're looking at? Is it before or after transfers from the government? So a lot of people receive money from the government from taxes other people have paid. Is it before or after the cost of your housing is taken into account of? And is it at the household level? Are we comparing households and their incomes or are we comparing individuals? And these all make a difference to the results you get. The standard way of doing it amongst most poverty campaigners and inequality campaigners is that it's after tax and after transfers and after housing costs are taken out. So what we compare is people's incomes after they've paid for their housing. So the, the, the money they've got left over to spend on other things. And it's at the household level. And there has to be some quite fine adjustments when you're looking at households because, of course, if you're in a household of one person, or a household of six people, how much money you need to leave, live the same standard of living uh, is quite different. But it's not, it's not linear. As you add people to the household, you don't just get an equal amount added on and on because there are efficiencies of living in, in groups. So they make these adjustments. That's the standard way of doing it. Right, so now we've got everybody's, the relevant incomes sorted out. How do we compare them? How do we measure the inequality between them? There's a variety of uh, ways of doing this. And two are very common. One is that you, you rank every household's income, and then you look at the 90th percentile income, so that's you know, near the top, and you look at the 10th percentile income, that's just up from the bottom, and you look at the difference between them. And that difference between them is a, a way of measuring income inequality. The more common measure is the so-called Gini coefficient. And here, um, now I've, I've, some of you will be familiar with this, some of you won't. I'll go through it very quickly. I'll first say that some people do it the other way around. They have the axes the other way around. Please don't be confused if that's what you're used to. It's the same, it's the same chart. What we've done here is the ranking again. So the x-axis is a ranking from the richest person in, let's say, the country. We're talking about Britain, let's say. So the richest person's down there at, the, at, at that far left end, and the poorest person uh, is up here. So what we do is we, we rank them like that, and then we say, well, how much income, what's the income of that first person, the first richest person? So that goes up on the y-axis. The next person, of course, is a little, there's a little less money there, so it goes up again, but not as much, and so on and so on. That's why the shape, this is curved in this way. That's why the shape of the line the, the main line there is a curve. Now, <clears throat> if, if the first person had all the income, right, nobody, everybody else got zero, the first person, the richest person got all the money, you, the line goes straight up and then flat across, right? And so the area, that would be one, because see the formulation A, the area between, uh, the, the area between the diagonal line and the top would be completely consumed by this line. So it would be A um, divided by A, it would be one. Um, if everybody earned exactly the same amount of money, the line would be the diagonal, right? Because each increment's exactly the same. And the Gini coefficient would be zero. So the Gini coefficient is between zero and one, and the higher the number, the less equal the society in income terms. Now this is the standard measure. And it's worth having a look at 
the findings by country and over time. So I'm, here I am looking at, we have a list of some selected countries and their Gini coefficients. Sorry, the decimal point's missing, but it's the same thing. And here we have a chart looking at the history of the Gini coefficient in the United Kingdom. It's interesting to note, I mean, I don't think these findings are terribly surprising. The United States, you'll note, is reasonably, reasonably high. Uh, it has less redistribution of wealth than a lot of countries in the West. Um, Sweden, as you might expect, is reasonably low. It's at 27 there, 0.27. Uh, my own native New Zealand's moderately high within the group. And Singapore is very high, uh, which is an interesting fact, which I'll come to in a second. Now let's look at what the history of inequality in the United Kingdom, uh, measured by the Gini coefficient. You'll note, I, I hope you can all see this, that, that starts at 1961. In 1960s and through the 70s, Britain was at about the level that Sweden's now at, um, reasonably low levels of income inequality. Then you'll notice that in 1979, it starts to rise. And it rises up until basically the beginning of the 1990s. Who knows why? Thatcher, yes. But it's not magic, right? Margaret Thatcher doesn't appear and suddenly the Gini coefficient, she had to do something. Um, so what, did she, what she did, obviously, is, uh, well, first the top rate of income tax came down during the period that she was Prime Minister, so that, that meant that high-income people got to keep more of their post-tax income. And the economy was liberalised in all sorts of ways that allowed people um, to get richer than they had been before. And that's... that's those and a bunch of other factors I won't go into led to this increase in uh, inequality. You'll notice also that there's a little dip around 2008-9. What happened there? Right, but why, interestingly, why should that reduce inequality? No, this is incomes we're looking at. I'll tell you why, quickly. The people at the bottom uh, earners, uh, there's a kind of base that they can't go below. They're getting unemployment benefits, they're earning minimum wage, let's say. So their earnings don't change. But the people higher up, their earnings do. The bankers don't get paid their bonuses, salary rises are cut. So the top comes down, the bottom stays where it is, and you get a narrowing of the distribution. So it's I interestingly that in periods of great economic growth, especially from low levels, you tend to get rising inequality. And when you've gone to a high level and then the economy is going down, inequality cramps. Singapore is an example of a rapidly growing economy which as a result partly has seen an increase in inequality. Now, uh, I'm not doing well on time. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly through a few defects in, the, in looking at income but, because I want to get to the main point. Uh, when you compare incomes in the way I've defined incomes. It's not completely accurate for a few reasons. One very simple reason is that poor people tend to live in cheaper places. Whenever I go outside of London, I'm amazed how cheap you can buy a round of drinks in a pub. Uh, and so you can see that the, the, if you just look at the incomes and think that tells you the different standards of living working out uh, that, that these people are experiencing, it's not entirely accurate because the poorer people generally live in cheaper places. Um, now, another very important point is that what matters always, and as the Adam and Eve example, is consumption. What we're concerned about is people's ability to consume. That's why they have incomes. It, a lot of consumption in the United Kingdom is not paid for out of your own money. You get free medical insurance in Britain through the, through the NHS. Children get to go to school for free. So this means that the difference in consumption levels uh, between people is exaggerated by the differences in their incomes. Imagine that everything except the last 100 pounds a year of your spending was supplied free by the state. Well then, I might have, a, I suppose I have an income of 100 pounds and you have 200 pounds, you're twice as rich as me, right? but you're not really. We're both consuming, let's say, we might both be consuming 20,000 pounds worth of goods and services supplied by the state, and then that little difference of what we get from our own money, that's, I've got two, twice as much as you, but that doesn't really mean I'm twice as well off as you. I'm only fractionally better off than you because it, this, this consumption is a tiny fraction of our total consumption. So this also exaggerates, so the measure of after-tax income 
exaggerates the differences in consumption. But here's the really important point, and this is the different understanding I want you to take away from this talk, if I can convince you, which is that money isn't what matters. Consumption, even, isn't what matters. And the quickest way of seeing this is to ask yourself, if you are upset and worried about the fact that Jeff Bezos is so much richer than George Soros, does that inequality, I think he's probably got, I think Soros is worth about 30 billion, I don't know, what's Bezos worth? Someone must know, it's 100 billion, right? That is so unfair. Aren't you in agony for George Soros? Don't you think he must go to bed weeping about the unjust inequality every night? Of course you don't, but why not? The reason you don't is that you know full well that if Bezos lost a billion tomorrow in his personal value, he wouldn't even notice, wouldn't make the slightest difference to his welfare. Once you get up to a certain level of wealth, additional wealth makes almost no difference at all to your welfare. And this general point is true even at lower levels of wealth or income. This is the principle of the diminishing marginal utility of income. Some of you will have heard this expression. Utility is a silly word. Uh, unfortunately, we have to deal with it. It basically just means something like welfare, or you could, you could think of it as happiness if you want. I don't think that's quite right, but think of it as happiness for now. So this is, this is a chart showing you that effect. We have income along the x-axis, and we have happiness or utility, or however you want to think of it, what that money's worth to you, what, how much good it does you, uh, on the y-axis. And as you get richer, each incremental bit of money matters less and less. Why, what's this got to do with equality? Well, if you're concerned about people's welfare, it's a quality of welfare that you're worried about, not a quality of money. As everybody gets richer, as everybody moves towards being billionaires, differences in their, in their incomes matter less and less. They have, so the, the, they're more equal. I mean, really, having a 10 billion and having 20 billion, from a welfare point of view, that's equal. And this has, in fact, happened. This is what the history of the last 40 years has been. In 1980, 40% of the world's population lived in absolute poverty. That's to say on two US dollars a day or less, and those are today's two dollars. That's been coming down, 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 so that by today, that number is 8%. I mean, it's, it's been the most astonishing progress, economic progress in the world. And that means that inequality has simultaneously diminished because they've all been, we've all been moving along this line. So there's often, it's often put up, we often say at the IEA, don't worry so much about inequality, worry about um, absolute poverty. Worry about the actual amount of money that people have. That's what matters. That's right, but as a side effect, if you're worried about utility and welfare, another implication of economic growth is that, or general economic growth that lifts the bottom up, is that inequality is simultaneously being reduced. And you know, I hope I've convinced you, and any time you meet people who say it's increased uh, inequality, tell them that it hasn't, it's decreased by miles, uh, and that they're sick materialists who are concerned only with money. Uh, if you're worried about people's happiness and welfare, then, then you should be celebrating the great equality of the current age. Thank you.